Welcome to Cax Bar and Podcast, Canada's first podcast bar. What that means is you can come here for food, you can come here for drinks, you can also come here and record a podcast. Come on down, we're located in downtown Calgary, Alberta in the Beltline area. See you soon. And we're rolling. Uh, this is my second podcast of the day here, but uh, I love doing this, so fuck yeah. I'm here with Dave Bradley. Uh, Dave Bradley, in short, he's uh, was his uh, Instagram says it all. It's his uh, handles Bitcoin Brains. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah. Do you, do you want me to put that in the show notes there? Sure. Okay, sweet. Yeah, no, uh, I met Dave uh, uh, through a mutual friend. Um, well, Tara and Sunny. So shout out Tara Sunny if you ever see this. And uh, and then uh, Dave um, it was part of the Bitcoin conference that was in Calgary a couple weeks ago, and uh, it was awesome. We Cax hosted their uh, after party here, and that night, I met a lot of cool people. Um, and before I dive into those cool people, how do you know JP? Awaken with JP, like that was that blew my mind when he walked. Yeah, in. I actually didn't know him before we brought him in for the conference, but oh, okay. we, I put a bounty out for his personal email. Yeah, and then somebody found me his personal email, and I just emailed him. And was like, "Do you want to come to a Bitcoin conference?" And that was all it took. Yeah, I mean, well, we 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 paid for him to come, but mm. we, uh, yeah, it was just I reached out and yeah. We wanted somebody who was like not really just like a straight up Bitcoiner, but somebody who, like the average person who's not a Bitcoiner, would know. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The uh, can you can you uh, like just just explain to people like your kind of history with that entire game, like or maybe just tell me your origin story, like uh, you know, yeah, like, like who are you, Dave? <laughs> you know, like where uh, are you from? Like how'd you la- like? Because you know, obviously, bit like crypto is uh, somewhat recent a uh, recent uh, phenomenon, if you will. So like, what'd you do before that? And you know, have you always been kind of like finance based and everything like that yeah no i've I'm never finance um mm. i've been a serial entrepreneur yep. my whole life Sweet. um before i got into bitcoin which is quite a long time ago um i had a recycling company that we sold off and then uh i got into bitcoin in 2010 um is that when it came out it came out in 2009 so okay. it was i was pretty close to the beginning mm-hmm. um i was mining it on some gpus in my basement mm-hmm. and uh eventually started selling it on a website called localbitcoins.com. Yeah. And so I was like meeting all these people at Tim Hortons, getting cash from them. Yeah. And like the Tim Hortons for sure thought I was selling drugs. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And so, um, at a certain point, like it was getting to the point where there was like three or four of these people meeting me a day. Um, this would be like early 2013. We decided to open an actual store. Mm -hmm. And so we opened the first like physical brick and mortar Bitcoin store in the world, which was, Oh, no way. Uh, here in Calgary, down on uh, 14th Street, right by Chicken on the Way. Oh, shit. And so Calgary is the first official brick-and-mortar Bitcoin store in the entire world? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing official about it, but uh, okay, okay. we were the first like store that was selling miners and yeah. and uh, Bitcoin. Basically, that was all there was to sell back then. Um, to, to newbies here, like, uh, like, like I, mining is literally crea- like creating the Bitcoin, essentially, like from, a, from computers, right? Like, yeah. um, is a... Uh, I, you know, like this might be too elementary of a question for you, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Like, uh, pretend I never met you before. Like, and I'm just like, oh man, like what is Bitcoin? Like, is there the sim- sim- most simple way that, that you can explain cryptocurrency to people? Because for the longest time, that was a confusion, right? Like no one really understood yeah. what it was. And then, and how come you understood what it was right away? Like, well, I didn't understand it right away. Um, I got into it as a way to just earn some more dollars. Mm. Um, I, I was buying a video card for gaming and I was like, oh, I can mine Bitcoin with this. I can justify a more expensive video card. And then like Bitcoin went up a lot in price right after I did that. And so the video card paid for itself in like a week. Hmm. I was like, oh, like I should probably buy another one, obviously. Yeah. And, uh, just kind of got into it that way as a way to make quick money. And Hmm. a lot of people get in that way. Hmm. A lot of people get in thinking it's like an investment or like a way to flip something and get more dollars. But eventually you realize the the meaning and the point of Bitcoin is much more important, much more profound. Oh yeah. But it is really simple. It's basically just Bitcoin is money. Mm -hmm. It's not an investment. It's not a, it's not a stock or a bond. There's no yield. You don't get any rights by owning Bitcoin. It's just money. Mm -hmm. And the point of money is to take the value that you create with your time and store it to use it later. Mm -hmm. And if you try to do that with dollars, you're going to have a bad time because while you're storing your value in dollars, the government's printing more dollars. Devaluing. Exactly. Yeah. So they're basically taking that value that you earned with your time and 
giving themselves the right to spend it elsewhere by printing those dollars. Right. Yes. And that, well, hence that's what inflation is essentially. Exactly. Okay. So, but, uh, but Bitcoin itself, it's a digital, like it's, it's, it's just a digital coin, if you will. Yeah. I mean, the important part, mm. the most important thing about Bitcoin is that you can never change the supply. It's got an entirely set and predictable supply because so there's a fixed amount in circulation. Yeah. There's, there's a fixed amount in circulation. There are new Bitcoins being created. So there is some inflation in Bitcoin because they're just breaking it down. Essentially. Um, is that what mining is like breaking down the initial no, big pie? And no, pie? it's there, there's an issuance schedule. So right now there's about 19 million Bitcoins have been issued okay. out of a total that will ever be issued of 21 million. So okay. they came out a lot quicker at the start and that was intended to be a lot like the, the supply curve of gold where it used to be really easy to find gold. Now you need like a multi-billion dollar mine to get gold mm -hmm. way under the earth and so Bitcoin's the same. It's not that there is no inflation. It's the inflation is now very low. It's around one percent for the next four years, and then at that point it cuts in half. So every four years, the rate at which new Bitcoins come out is cut in half, mm -hmm. and that's not super important. The important part is that it can't be changed. There's no one in charge. And you mentioned cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. and am I, am I, yeah, I'm, I'm skewing the terminology. Yeah, right. Like, so isn't Bitcoin a form of um, cryptocurrency? Te technically, it is, I guess, yeah. but most of what is referred to as cryptocurrency, basically every other coin that's in the in the bundle of cryptocurrency, is somewhere between a bad idea and a scam. And the reason for that, at, at its core, is that they all have someone in charge. There's, you know, you look down the list, and basically every founder of every major coin has become a billionaire, and that's kind of what was hard to recreate about Bitcoin is that the founder Satoshi Nakamoto disappeared and potentially died way before getting to the point of being a billionaire, way before it was like too much money to walk away from. Right. Mm -hmm. And so whether or not that person walked away or, or died, we don't know, but they're no longer involved and the, they've no longer kept control of the project. Yeah. And so now there's actually no one in control. Uh -huh. And any changes that need to happen to Bitcoin need to happen with a consensus, which is, is very hard to achieve. So it's very hard to change anything. And the hardest thing that you could ever change would be the supply, because that's the most important thing to everyone who's involved in the Bitcoin network mm -hmm. is that it has that fixed supply. Mm -hmm. And so no one can print money to spend money and therefore take the value that we we've created. Okay. So, so these other coins, then they literally are separate from Bitcoin. Like, you know, like you're like, you're like Elon Musk's a uh, doge coin, I think it is. And then you got like, like, cause all these people, all these uh, people, they, they essentially create more coins every day. And, but when they create it, like, do they, are they saying, okay, there's also 21 million fix of it. And now, um, now they start to like divvy it up. Uh, so a lot of different coins have a lot of different ideas about what their supply is going to be. Yeah. But when it comes down to it, there's somebody in charge of the coin at the end of the day. So like the number two coin is Ethereum. Okay. Um, there's a foundation run by a guy named Vitalik Buterin, who's the founder of Ethereum. And whatever he says goes. And they okay. literally have a conference call to decide what the supply of Ethereum will be. Mm -hmm. And so that's not any different than the way that the Fed decides what that's the supply of money involved. being printed. Or whatever. Yeah, exactly. They, okay, so, so Ethereum has... We don't know if it has a fixed supply then. It doesn't. It, it, doesn't, can, be, it, can, it can be changed be. at any time. Okay. Well, then th what's the point of that then versus like, well, money? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so like, he so is, the, he's just a government on his own. He's a one person government. So the main thing, it, yeah, it, what, what has happened is instead of um, ivory tower bankers deciding the money supply, you have basement nerds. And that might be better, but <sighs> it's not fixing the problem wherein if someone has the power to print your money, they will. Inevitably, that's what's been the history of every printable form of money in the world. And that's why gold became the best form of money for most of human history is because it was very hard to get. It was very hard to produce. Yeah. It was a cost to produce it. Right. And like money itself, like the notes used to represent the gold. Yeah. It's exactly. like carrying gold around you carried a representation of, but then, you know, like, like I think it was Nixon that took it, took, took the gold standard off, which means that money now is just money. Like, you know, and then hence, hence the, just the insane, <laughs> like insanity of it all. <laughs> yeah, there, there, that the removal of the gold standard happened in two steps, and that the final one was 1971. Mm -hmm. And there's a really interesting website. I think it's WTF happened in 1971, mm -hmm. and it's just full of all of these stats about like essentially the world started getting a lot worse in 1971, and the reason for that was because the governments of the world now had a tool 
that would allow them to spend money at an unchecked pace mm -hmm. without the need for direct taxation. It's a form of taxation when they print money because they're yeah. just taking the value from us. Yeah. But we don't see it. They don't have to look us in the eyes. They don't have to send us a form saying you paid this much tax, right? Mm -hmm. it, they just take little by little. And in doing so, they've been able to really run up the scam over, over decades. Mm -hmm. And it's only recently that they've really pushed too hard, I think, where you know, we saw where the way the world went with COVID and they, they basically just uh, decided to print an unlimited amount of money to spend on virtually everything that they can think of. And it's only a couple of years later that we're really feeling the bite of inflation at a personal level. Like most people mm -hmm. are actually feeling it now. Mm -hmm. Whereas when they were stealing at a rate of like two, 3% a year and saying, this is what we need to steal at for the health of the economy. It was something that people could bear a lot more easily. And mm -hmm. now I think it's really just sunk in that, you know, the, the world's not right. And the underlying cause is all the value that they steal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, um, the, uh, I mean, it's, 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 you know, like I actually had a, had an episode that was pulled because we <laughs> talked about this so hard, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, allegedly anyway. <laughs> yeah. But I don't, I don't know. It's like, um, like, like, like what, what would without money though, we'd be kind of be back to, you know, like beating the shit out of each other to take things. Oh, yeah. Like, so the idea of creating a currency was, it's not ultimately a bad thing, No, but, not at uh, all. but it's like, it's just classic humans you know at the top just too corrupt to yeah to, to do it ethically if yeah you will. M money is one of the most important things humans have ever invented mm -hmm. it's essentially a way that we organize our time right yeah. it's how we how we give value to different ways that people spend their time and how you can compare and and solve this problem called the coincidence of wants where like you know if you're a home builder you you only get your client once but if you're a fisherman you get the same client many many times and it's very hard to have enough fish to buy a house right, right and so yeah. money is the intermediary that allows different denominations of value to be exchanged for each other mm. in a neutral way and it's supposed to provide pricing feedback across the entire economy so it's supposed to be able to give us the information about whether a house how, how valuable a house is compared to a fish and yeah. everything else in the economy related to to each other but now because the government takes so much of that value out of it it's like when when I, when, if I were to buy a, a drink from you, mm. like the government's getting their hands into that, not just in the form of taxation, every, every element of commerce is, is hit by that inflation. Mm. So if you take the money that you earn when I buy a drink from you and you put that in the bank, slowly the government's taking that yeah. value mm. and really it's, it's just, it's twisted all the incentive systems mm. and now money, if anything, is viewed by a lot of people as a force of, of, of evil in the world. And that's because money gets used in ways that are contrary to the incentives that, that it, it should be propping up. Mm -hmm. Right. And so your incentive as a normal person is not necessarily to work hard, earn money. Your incentive is to get a job that brings you as close as possible to where all the free money pours into the economy. And that's why you see people who have, you know, jobs in the finance industry, um, the, the bankers, the lawyers, the accountants of the world that are a lot closer to that spigot actually don't provide any value to the world. They just essentially act as middlemen and, and siphon a greater and greater amount of that free money that's being poured back into the economy away yeah. without really adding any value. Yeah, I mean, like, um, I mean, that's just, that's just one of the ironies of, of just being a human being, like just the... Like that fact that uh, what you just said, the people that create not much tangible value are the people ra raking most of the rewards. <clears throat> and uh, but at the same time, the majority let this happen because they don't know essentially how to do anything about that. Um, or if they do think that there's a way to do it, they're not willing to devote their whole life to to this revolutionary change because it, it's just it's just too energy consuming. They just rather play the game realize they're not going to be happy five days a week and be happy three days a week. You yeah. Know what I mean, um, which is pretty, pretty sad. Like, you know, like, like I, like I'm a fellow entrepreneur. So, you know, like I ventured into this game because of like, I, I hit a wall where I was like, I got to do the things I love because that's the only thing that keeps me happy, happy ish. And from there, it'd be, it'd be great if I can find a way to do what I love and, and make money off of it, you know what I mean? Or pr provide some kind of value or have that somehow connect to making money. So, you know, at the end of the day, like I'm a bar guy, so open a bar. I love podcasts. I love this. 
I love this entire conversation already. And how often do I get to talk to people like this, you know, without, you know, dialed in like this, like, you know, I've had beers many times and it's not as like right here. It's like, I'm almost getting a private yeah. lecture here, <laughs> you know, like absorbing an actual, you know, university education, which, which I have a degree too, which, but that degree was kind of like a joke in hindsight. Like, like the, the actual um, schooling was not very pragmatic, if you will. But obviously, I still enjoyed my four years of university because there are things I, I developed. There are skills I developed there that I wouldn't have developed at that time point in time without going through the system. But um, yeah, and it's like, uh, and right now it's, but right now it's like, um, what 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 is your what is your theory as to if money is this corrupt and it's causing people to not be able to pursue their passions, um, well, well, majority of people not be able to pursue their passions, like. What is the answer to ending this corruption? Is it just like you, uh, converging to something like Bitcoin? Have everyone start using that because that again, it's, like, it's almost like a fresh start. As long as the rules stay the, what they are, which is as in there's no no owner, there's no uh, there's no government, if you will. The people are the government. It's it's it, you know fixed amount, um, and you essentially just just start to exist through spending it and and trading it like that. Like is that is that like the first solution here? Yeah. So the, this problem was identified a very long time ago mm -hmm. and it really, it really started in the, the, the early uh, 20th century with the creation of the federal reserve mm -hmm. and the idea of central banking and the idea that you should have these people controlling that value and where the value sits, not that it should be backed by uh, something, something finite like gold mm -hmm. and, and hopefully something valuable. Mm -hmm. And so, Ever since then, people have been identifying the problem, mm -hmm. and there's been a couple of really interesting people who've written about it since then. There was a, an economist by the name of F. A. Hayek, who is one of the leaders of the, the the school of Austrian economics. Basically, had identified that money is being corrupted in the way that I'm describing, and his his prediction was that we will never be able to take the power to print money away from the government because the government will always have a monopoly on violence, which they will pay for with their ability to print money. And so what he proposed was that at some point in the future, we're going to need essentially a sneaky way to get the power of money printing away from the government. Mm -hmm. And then many years later in the early 90s, um, there's a book called The Sovereign Individual that's like one of the most important books I've ever read, I would say, um, predicted a whole bunch of things. And one of the things that it predicted was essentially Bitcoin, in answer to this same problem, it said that at some point in the future, using the internet and, and cryptography, which is getting pretty specific now, um, we will invent something that allows the creation of money without the state. And when we uh, when we when we invent this new form of money, in the long term, what it's going to mean is that it will permanently defund the large scale nation state and its ability to exist and its ability to exert its control through violence in the way that it does now. Mm. And the the final quote that I would add to that is from a guy named Saifedean Moose who wrote a book that's kind of like the Bible of Bitcoin called the Bitcoin Standard, describes a lot about the history of money. And his quote is that Bitcoin is the technology that will finally end World War I. Because right around the time that World War I kicked off was when they basically invented this idea that they can print money to spend money. And... Since then, the world has been in a nearly permanent state of war. You know, there's always a large-scale international conflict going on somewhere. Oh, well, of, of, that, of that type of war, war over, essentially, the yeah. resources. Because prior to that, we were, humans were always at war, well, but just not, the, the not, like, not that scale, you know? Like, yeah, uh, and the difference is that wars used to end when one side ran out of money. And there's no way to run out of money anymore. Mm -hmm. And you've got the same financiers who run the, the central banks of the world funding both sides of virtually every war and really enriching themselves and their own cronies. And they're doing that with value that they've put into the economy through money that they've printed. And that's value that we were supposed to be able to spend because we earned it. Mm. And instead it's being spent on wars that we don't care about. Do you, um, this might be an out there question, but uh, well, first of all, are you, are you, are you spiritual, religious, like do you believe in God or? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I believe in God, I would say. Yeah. I'm okay, not... So what's your definition of God? Like, um, as you know it. Yeah, so it, it's it's a big one, and I promise um, this ties back into what we're yeah, talking yeah. About. Um, I I would say that we know instinctively that there's something greater than us, and that's where we come come up with the question. It's a question that like my my son who's six or he he's nine now, but he asked me this when he was six, and he asked me, Dad, where is space? Like, 
we're, we're watching a show about the universe and he's like, well, that must be somewhere, right? So we know that there's always something greater and we have this instinct to seek that and people seek it through religion or meditation or spiritualism or science or a whole bunch of different ways. But I, I think everybody's seeking the same thing and it, I would say it's pretty comfortable to call it God. Okay. Um, this thing that you think everyone's seeking, do you think it's a single separate conscious entity that, I, I that don't know. you know what I'm saying? Like, kind of like, you know, how, like, say you own 10 dogs, like you might be God to the dogs, yeah. right? You know, like, I, I doubt it's a, um, I doubt it's an old man with a staff and a beard. Right. Um, I think it, it's very unlikely that it, there is a conscious entity that gives a fuck about what's going on in our world because it's just too much happening. Yeah. Like, there's, like, there's a lot of evidence that there is, it'd be like us. We're literally just like an ant who, Oh, the ant got squished. Like who cares? Like, yeah. You know? Yeah. I think that's a pretty good metaphor. Cause mm -hmm. it's like, what do you think the ants think of us? Right. Right. And, and the answer is like, they don't. Right. And mm -hmm. so to us, our, our consciousness is so much greater than that of an ant. Yeah. And that it, it seems rational to me that if there is this greater thing that we're seeking, that it, it would be a similar relationship. And, mm -hmm like something that we couldn't understand any more than the ants can understand us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for all we know, we don't have the ability to understand this. Like, like yeah. the question already stops at the question. Um, but what I, why I bring this up is because um, lately there's been a lot of theories about uh, forget God for a second, like perhaps like the omnis omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, atemporal being like, we're talking about just whatever p potentially humor me and, 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 and say, you believe that there's, there's something that's watching us that's programming us just like just like at a zoo like the animals they kind of wake up their food they wake up they oh so there's a new addition to the, the monkey bars for the monkey or like oh there's another river now all of a sudden for the lion when he's asleep mm -hmm. he doesn't know like all of a sudden his environment things are added but he just starts using it like and now his life has that included in it so there's these theories that you know like that you know there's probably aliens out there that you know like the anunnaki specifically is like seems to be this popular trend right now that because of like ancient sumerian texts essentially have all been um, uh, passed down and translated over until it reached people now to explain like there used to be the Anunnaki, which is like bigger humans essentially that took their DNA and turned whatever uh, animals like like uh, like apes and monkeys into us, so that we can essentially do the bidding of of mining for gold. Is the is that because apparently gold somehow is like that like that material is apparently some kind of like super resource, literally like out of Dune, like like for them or something. And then the pyramids are apparently satellites that send signals like, you know, they're, they're like a 5G network tower to them or something like mm -hmm. that. But what I'm trying to say is that when these people like imagine like they they did create us just like a like I had this analogy on, my, on a couple of episodes on my podcast ago. But if there's a chessboard, you know how like there's a pawn and a rook and a king and a queen like, like a pawn can only do pawn stuff and it can never be like a, a rook. Well, unless it makes it to the other end after the rook's been dead, uh, you play chess, right? Yeah. So it's like maybe the concept of money or like of some kind of currency, because the way I look at it, it's like it's such an intricate, well thought out, super organizer, if you will, to com total complete chaos. Because like without it, it's like it's like because with it, it, it will it will sift people out into like their their role. Like, are you a pawn or a king or a rook? Because like a pawn might be someone who's like, I just want to clock in at nine, clock out at five. Uh, have a beer with my buddy from five to six, be at home and have dinner from six to eight. And then, and then eight to nine, watch that show as a family. And then nine to 10, read my kid. Good, you know, like, but then you have the one who's a queen, who's like, like a, a like a 3d entrepreneur. You know what I mean? Like, like thinking you got, your, those are Elon Musk. And like, when I take a look at earth, like the world, sometimes I'm like, it seems like it, that analogy might be accurate. Cause it seems like there's a perfect uh, organization of like, that's like majority are the pawns. And then and it gets less and less for each of those roles. Like, uh, and then finally you have the king and the queen, like the super players, like the rare humans, the outliers who, you know, so it's like, but by having something like money be in circulation and then being able to, to fuck with it and manipulate it, it's, it's the perfect way to keep people within their, their roles to maintain some kind of order, right? Because you can give a bum a million dollars. He's not going to the next day utilize his time properly. He's just going to go into a hedonistic state of like craziness, right? You know, so it's like, uh, so then when I think back, okay, but if there's something like a, like Bitcoin that's now introduced where you can't really fuck with it, it, like in the way that it's been, money's been fucked with, is it just a matter of time with that coin that all these little micro roles of people again, find itself, you know, like, as in, you'll be like, yo, um, 
Joe here only wants, as an example, 10 Bitcoin. Like he doesn't want any more, he doesn't want any less. He can use 10 because of that 10, maybe the one he, he uses it to, for food for a year. And then what, you know, and then it's like, and then, so basically I'm saying, I don't think like solving money corruption will ever solve human beings trying to like maximize their potential. I think it just reveals again, like who is what and what role. Um, but the only difference is that perhaps there's a little bit less of a burden of, of, of in inequality. Yeah. So there's an important concept going on in there um, called emergent order. And this is what governs most of the natural systems in the world. And you can see it. it it's essentially the concept that out of chaos, the results of many small actions will result in a form of order. And so you can, can you say see that one more time, sir. Out, out, of, out of chaos, yeah. the, the sum of many small actions will, will result in an order. Okay. And so a really good example of this is when you see a path through a field and you've got like the city built a path and it's in a, just a nice looking winding place, but that's not where people wanted to walk. We all know where we wanted to walk. And so the path forms where we all wanted to walk, right? Yes. And that is many of us making the same choice for the same reasons in the, in the same place with the same stimulus. And then the order emerges from that. Mm -hmm. And this is the, this is the force that governs like the economy. It governs like ecosystems, mm -hmm. evolution, like it governs sports too. Yeah. And any, we anywhere know, that like... order emerges from chaos, this is basically what's going on. And this should be what's happening in the economy. Right. And when you describe like the different roles in the economy, you're obviously going to have, a large number of people that are closer to average and mm -hmm. then and then some outliers that um, perform exceptionally well and exceptionally poorly as well mm -hmm. in both directions and what's being skewed right now is that the 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 feedback mechanisms that lead to those exceptional humans having the best results for their lives or those who are able to most effectively grasp their position in this hierarchy and and what should be happening is that the people who work hardest, the people who have the best ideas, the people who make the greatest things should have the most success. And the problem now is that this, the forces that normally would drive this emergent order have been perverted because it's, I get what you're saying. It's, it's like a pawn now has the role of the queen when he shouldn't, doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah. And, like and it, might, we wouldn't be playing the board the right way. He's, yeah. he's still moving like a pawn. And it's, it's just like the example of the path through the park where like mm. some government planner was like, oh yeah, we need an S shape in our path. And then, so that's how they make the path. Mm. And like the, the, the users of the path collectively decide that's not where we're going to walk because that's stupid. We're going to walk straight down the middle Yeah, and a path forms like that. Mm. It, uh, it, it, that kind of decision making is repeated throughout society, really, right? It's like instead of allowing the people who have the skin in the game to make the choices for their lives, those choices are delegated to others in the form of money. Mm. And the more money that gets siphoned away through taxes and inflation, the, the, the fewer choices you get to make for your own life. And therefore, the more choices someone else who actually doesn't care about your life is making for your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, um, do you like? Do you believe there's a potential that this was an accidental phenomena? Uh, no, <laughs> you think it's premeditated for sure. Hey, eh? the yeah, people it, at the top are just greedy, so greedy that they're like, yeah. like let's let's just crush these like the people like more so that the end game will be total. Um, uh, what do we call it? Comply complying because they're so destitute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, there's a there's a book that's worth reading called The Creature from Jekyll Island written in the 50s it was written about the creation of the federal reserve and it outlines the fact that it was a very deliberate conspiracy to create a new form of money that would allow them to siphon more and more value away from us and and i think wasn't it rockefeller who's part of this group that yeah because yeah, he literally passed the law or during christmas or something like yeah that. it was the the rockefellers jp morgan it was yeah, the the yeah. who's who of the the carnegies the mm -hmm. the who's who of of the financial world at that time mm -hmm. And they created a new form of indentured servitude, really, essentially, because mm -hmm. they created a situation where we have to work and the value doesn't go to us. And so it's, you know, if, you, if you're forced to work 100% of the time and you get paid nothing, you're a slave, right? So now I would say, like educated guests, we get something in the range of 
20 to 40% of our value that we create. So are we, does that mean we're like 60% slaves? Like essentially that's what it means. And yeah, that's, oh yeah. that's the conspiracy that they have contrived to, uh, to create. Just so they can have more wealth. On so, the so that they can have more wealth without creating value. And now I think we're getting to a point where that money printing is getting kind of out of control. And in a lot of Western countries, I like the the metaphor of uh, like you've got Wiley e. Coyote chasing the Roadrunner. The Roadrunner goes zipping across this canyon, and then uh, Wiley e. Coyote runs out above the canyon, and uh, he pauses in the midair there for a second. He doesn't realize he should be falling yet, you know. Yeah. But he's already off the cliff. It's too late. Mm. And a lot of our currencies are right at that point where it hasn't really started the free fall. We're, we're, we're feeling the, the negative impact of inflation, but because so many countries around the world have all been printing all at the same time, the, only the ones that have really printed at an absolutely excessive rate, the Zimbabwe's, Lebanon, Venezuela, Argentina to a lesser extent, like those, Vietnam. Are, yeah, th those are the countries where the currency has really collapsed and yeah. we haven't even seen it here yet, but we will. Oh man, like I, I had a vacation in Vietnam right before COVID and yeah, you literally pay with like, Fifty thousand dollar bills, you know what I mean? Like it's like to even, to even. Um, um, oh, by the way, do you need another drink? Sure. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I can get. I can cut this part. Yeah. The um, sorry, just picking up where we left off. We had to order drinks, which, by the way, you can order if you rent out the podcast studio here at Cax Barn Podcast. One of the fun things is as you're recording, you you literally we're literally in a bar, so you can get drinks. <laughs> You can visit CaxBarPodcast.com to uh, rent the studio out. It's fully equipped. You don't have to bring anything. And anyway, sorry, shameless plug for my <laughs> my business here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um. Okay. So right now, the like, quick question about um, like you know, something like um, with all these new coins being like constantly existing, wouldn't that also diminish the value of like you know, like because you're you you basically just do use, use Bitcoin, yeah, yeah. Like, wouldn't that diminish Bitcoin if more people are are participating now, but not with Bitcoin? Yeah. So. There will be an in, inevitably an infinite number of other coins that people can make, but money is just a consensus, really, right? Yeah. And it's it's just like comparing um, like the United States dollar to like the currency of some small African nation, mm -hmm. right? Like it doesn't matter if South Sudan launches its new currency, like that doesn't really affect the the usefulness of as money for the U.S. dollar. And so ultimately, like what we've seen throughout history is that harder forms of money will eat the softer forms of money. So there was, um, for example, in North Africa, about 500 years ago, one of the most common forms of money were these glass beads that they made. And there was a painstaking process to very manually make these glass beads. And so because they had a lot of proof of work, they had a lot of work that went into them. They were a good form of money for the North Africans. Mm -hmm. And then the Portuguese got there and they're like, oh man, we can make glass beads way better than these Africans can. And they started just showing up with boatloads and boatloads of glass beads mm. and essentially flooding the economy. Mm. That drove a lot of the a lot of the North African slave trade back then as they were buying them with, with printed money, with glass beads that they just mm. made for free or for, yeah. for nearly free. And the net result was that in all of those areas, gold supplanted the glass beads as the form of money because gold is much harder to to do that with than mm. glass beads and so the same will be true with bitcoin is because bitcoin it, is the hardest money to produce mm. it will choke out all those other monies because inevitably like inevitably the, it's just most popular too it's well yeah it's 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 got the it's, lead it's, which helps it's, it's the us dollar version of yeah exactly and and it, inevitably when you look at something like ethereum which is the number two by market cap they will choose to print more money at some point right and and then, it, then it's, it's kind of no different than actual money, except yeah. for like it's not actually in in um, being utilized by like the actual government or whatever. Yeah, and they're bo both are are just a consensus, right? Whether it's Ethereum or Bitcoin or dollars, they're just a consensus. And the difference is with the dollar, the consensus is delegated to us from the government, and they say at gunpoint, basically, like you must accept this money within Canada. And Bitcoin is entirely vo voluntary. That that you can say that of Ethereum as well. It's entirely voluntary. There's a lot of good things about Ethereum in terms of a form of money, but it's vastly inferior to Bitcoin. And mm -hmm. so inevitably, when the Ethereum kids decide that they need to print money because they run out of the money that they're spending, which they will do at some point, we will see that will drive the drive the 
the business of money to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. It'll be market forces and inevitably the money with the most restricted supply, the, with the supply that cannot be changed will be the winner. Yeah. So, okay. Um, why 21 million? Cause like, think about it, the world's billions of people. So yeah. if everyone wanted to use Bitcoin, like how, how do you, yeah, it's, it's kind of a weird, um, a weird denomination because one Bitcoin as currently constructed could go to eight decimal places. So there are a hundred million Satoshis, which is the smallest denomination of a, of a Bitcoin in one Bitcoin. Okay. And so you could put the names anywhere you want. What matters is, is the, the number of units more so than, you know, where we decide to, to put the word Bitcoin, I guess. And so inevitably like things will never be priced in Bitcoin. Things will be priced in Satoshis at some point. Okay. Because it's just not realistic to spend an entire Bitcoin on. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And well, so well, yeah, like, yeah. If, 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 so, so do they just keep on creating more sats within one Bitcoin um, by splitting it and splitting it, they, infinitely splitting it? So they, like they don't, but they could, right? So right now there's a hundred million. That's where the decimal point lies. And with uh, some different technologies like the lightning network, it actually goes to, to 12 decimal places. Okay. So, so, so what is that number? Um, like, cause, uh, so 12, 12 decimal places would be, um, it would be a uh, hundred billion, 100 billion. Okay. Yeah. And so, okay. The, the, that's, can that's you, a very small unit. And it's, can you repeat that one more time? I'm just trying to wrap my head around. Okay. Yeah. So and so one, one coin can be split to, yeah. And, and a, a very important metaphor to get right here is because this is something that the fiat economists criticize Bitcoin for a lot is that you can always split it into more units. Right. But yeah. if you have a, if you have a pizza, yeah. And it's got eight pieces. Okay. You can then cut it all of those pieces in half. Yeah. And you're going to have 16 pieces. Yes. Yes. But you're not going to have any more pizza. Yeah. Right. So right. you're, you, you yeah. can divide the same finite thing mm. an infinite number of times. And for the purposes of counting and, and essentially the unit that we use for record keeping can go to wherever we need it to be mm. as long as the, the top number. The twenty-one million is the part that stays fixed as long yeah, as no. Yeah. So am I? So am I asking the right thing? Like, yeah, you just keep splitting it. And yeah, as long as you don't moving the, the yeah. decimals of of, of, well, of and then just yeah. And to be clear, it, it never has split like that. There is like the Bitcoin network has always had eight decimals, and the Lightning network, which is a new side chain layer two, um, has has twelve. But nothing has actually ever changed. But it could. Yeah, and it could change without adding more to the supply of Bitcoin. Yeah, That's you just, the important you just part. move the decimal and create a different yeah. um, category. Like as you said, there was lightning, yeah. and then okay. So like the goal be to pay in in Sats as as you were as the Satoshi like it, the Sats is the lowest denomination, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, so is the is the goal for for you know the Bitcoin movement to see enough participants and people t con having consensus into the situation to say like. Oh, hey, Dave, you want a beer? It's 1,000 sats. And then like, yeah. and then, yeah. Dude, Eventually, like, that's where we'll go. Yeah. There, there's three main <laughs> things that money does. The first is that it stores value. That's what we've been talking about. And that's the most important one. That's what underpins everything else. And so once a form of money can store value, it can move to the second one, which is a medium of exchange. And so that's where we're kind of at right now is we're trying to get it to be a medium of exchange. It's very good at storing value. Anybody who's had money in Bitcoin for the last five years or let alone 10 years has had their value preserved much better than in, in anything dollar denominated, right? It's when compared to any other investment in the world, it's the best investment in the world consistently. How do they determine again, the, the value of it converting to, to, to like today's dollars, like, um, in American? It, like, it's, like it's a market system. So it's okay. whatever somebody's willing to pay. So you got mm. bids and assets. Like a share. There is like a stock. Yeah. And it, the, the difference is that Bitcoin is the only truly free market in the world. And it, it trades 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, it's not just six at, at a scale of tr trillions of dollars a day. So it's mm. one of the most liquid tradable things in the world. So is it, so I, I, I know I sound ridiculous asking some of these basic questions, but uh, you know, I just, again, I want to, want to make sure I even have the foundation fund fundamentals uh, understood here. Like, so is, is like, is there a, a stock for Bitcoin with real, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So there are there are Bitcoin stocks, which are essentially exchange traded funds, and what those are is essentially someone, a company out there, has raised some money to buy some Bitcoin, hold them in a company, and then listed the shares in that company on the stock exchange, and so they basically buy or sell Bitcoin every day 
to match the movement to the stock. And so they can redeem or issue more shares. And the idea is that one of these shares is supposed to represent the same value of a Bitcoin. So you get the first piece of the, the usefulness of Bitcoin, which is that exposure to the price of Bitcoin and the, its ability to just store value over time. You don't get the medium of exchange side. And the medium of exchange side is important in a couple of reasons. One is that it's it's the intermediary step to what you were talking about, which is the pricing. But it's also important that Bitcoin in many ways can be a, a superior medium of exchange to dollars. And especially as we're moving towards like the idea of central bank digital currencies. And you know, most of our most of our money is digital now. And we've seen with the trucker protests and the, the way they went after the bank accounts that the government can affect your ability to use your money as a medium of exchange. They can affect your ability to pay for things with your, with your money, which is really a pretty important part of its usefulness, right? It's everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you can't pay for it, then it's not going to do you much good. Mm-hmm. And so Bitcoin can come in and be another angle to increase your freedom because it's a form of money that the government can't stop you from spending. You don't need the government's permission to send your Bitcoin anywhere. And there's nothing that they can do to stop you from sending. Right. The, well, I guess the only dis- potential disadvantage is like, um, like a phone getting hacked, maybe. Yeah, yeah, because so, like because because you have no protection, so you can rob each other quite literally. Yeah, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's not like you can be like, oh, I have insurance or something. Like, yeah, yeah so exactly. I think so that's a that's one downside potentially. The, the way that I describe it, and I have like I have bitcoins in my phone in my pocket, mm. and I have cash in my other pocket. And I would say that it's a good idea to keep an amount of money in Bitcoin in your phone that is comparable to what you're comfortable with keeping cash in your pocket. So it is. Where do you store the rest then? So the the rest of your Bitcoin should be stored um, in in a dedicated device of some kind, usually a a hardware wallet. They're essentially just like a little device that you can get that's devoted specifically to storing Bitcoin. Okay. And they're designed to be very very difficult to hack, even if somebody has physical access to it. Okay. And they've got a bunch of other features to help you keep your money safe. So worst case, if you physically lose that wallet, you might have lost it, but they don't get access to it either. Well, so there's no sense in stealing it. And so you, you, there's a couple different things that you can do on there. One is that there is usually a 12 or 24 word backup. You write down these 12 words or even memorize the 12 words. And you can restore that Bitcoin wallet into any new copy of that device. And so you can walk across a border with the 12 words in your head with millions or billions of dollars stored in those 12 words and there's nothing the government can do at that border to stop you from moving across that border so it's a different kind of freedom that we've never had a way to move our money without the permission or help of the government whatsoever mm. and the next step is like i think what you're talking about is like some of these hardware wallets these devices will have kind of like um like a panic pin so it's like maybe you got a whole bunch of money on your device and then you set up a panic wallet and if somebody's got you at gunpoint, for example, you punch in the panic pin and then they get like 1500 bucks or something like that. And it looks like that's all you've got in there. And so it, because it's digital, actually opens up a lot more ways that you can move and store your money. Mm. It takes a bit more time to learn some of this stuff. Mm. It's like, it's probably about as hard as setting up like an online bank account. Mm. But like, it's very worthwhile if you're willing to take on the responsibility of essentially being your own bank. You can, you can, hold your own money, keep keep the government from inflating it to zero and spend it or send it anywhere you want without anyone's permission. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's the first two things, the store value medium of exchange. And then the last one you were talking about is eventually we get to the point where things start being priced in Bitcoin. And the, the moment that that will start is when the dollar inflation starts to get so insane that it doesn't make sense to price things in dollars, right? Because I think we're kind of there now sometimes, man. Like, well, you know, Bitcoin you know, is pretty does. volatile on a day-to-day basis as well, even more so than the dollar. But some places like in Venezuela, like you can't price things in bolivars because if you're like, yeah, I've got these bananas for 100 bolivars, like the next day it's going to be 300 bolivars. Yeah. And, it, and at that point it's not useful as a way to describe value. It's not useful. It, yeah, it's inconsistent. It's way too, yeah. way too uh, uh, volatile. Yeah. yeah. And so okay. at a certain point, so how, how can we stabilize it enough so that it makes, <laughs> oh, yeah, <all> good. <laughs> yeah, at a certain point, hmm. we'll, we'll get to a point where the dollar will be more volatile than Bitcoin. And then people will just naturally start pricing things in Bitcoin. Yeah. But again, though, but if you're pricing things in Bitcoin, like it'd be like, um, 
I mean, yeah, because the volatility of it, it, it's, you know, like you could, you could price it like, okay, this beer is for, for argument's sake, 10 sats. Mm-hmm. And by the time I like try to tip out my staff, like, okay, 10 stat, sats, 20%, you get two sats, eight sats, goes at a house or whatever it is. It's like, um, it might be like, oh, now it's worth five sats. Yeah, exactly. Like, or, so, or, you know, so it's like, ah, oh, shit. So, so like, assume- how, so wouldn't, how do you, how would you be able to price things? Well, you know? what, what, what will happen is that the dollar will get worse at that at the same time Bitcoin's getting better. And so right now, Bitcoin changes mostly in relation to the dollar. And then the dollar is what we use to price everything else. And so that makes it seem like Bitcoin is changing in value quite drastically in the relation to everything else. But at a certain point, it'll become evident that the dollar itself is what's actually moving more than Bitcoin. And, you know, when you start to think about, like, what do I actually... What is this actually worth? It's going to be kind of a natural transition that people will start to think in Bitcoin, and it's there are very few people who think in Bitcoin. Like I kind, I I try to, and I've I've been in Bitcoin for fourteen years now, and I only barely ever think in Bitcoin. So, so if you don't think in Bitcoin, then you can't really start to directly price things like that. Because a person who doesn't think in Bitcoin, how can? Because it, it, as an example, it might be like again, like oh, this beer is ten sats, um, and then you're like. Um, no, sorry. It would be like, okay, oh, I bought this beer for ten sats. It's like, yeah, but it's right now in this next hour it's gonna be twenty sats. Yeah, yeah. Because you're so, you already know how it fluctuates and they're like and then the other guy speaks Bitcoin, so he'll also be like, Correct, twenty sats, yes. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. You know like you know, like so again, like it, I don't see that being um Well, at some point the same thing will happen with dollars. Mm. There'll be a point where your dollars don't hold the value to the next day. Yeah. And it's it's at that point that Bitcoin will become necessary as a pricing tool. Right now it's like it's kind of a novelty that like the only reason that you'd want to price things in Bitcoin now is if your inputs are in Bitcoin. So if you were buying your beer in Bitcoin and you could only buy it in Bitcoin, then it would make sense for you to price your beer in Bitcoin, right? Well, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm in over my head and I'm standing it right now, but but again, even if even if that was the case, like the again, the value would change maybe not as volatile as a dollar was day to day, but I mean, still volatile, even if it's a weak difference, like, you know, then, you know, that would affect fairness and, you know, like in the way its value is for, you know, like tipping out staff or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. so, and it, so maybe, it, maybe it can't really be done. Well, yet. It, like, it can't be done yet. And it's, there, there's another saying that is, uh, there, I think there's a book based on this now that uh, a guy named Parker Lewis wrote a really great essay, uh, called gradually then suddenly. And, what we're going to see, I think, with Bitcoin adoption is a lot more people getting into it for the store of value still. That's going to be the main thing. Lots of people get in there because they're basically gambling, but then eventually a bunch of those people, that, like they actually learn the reason that this goes up is because it's storing value, not because it's adding value. And the next thing... When you is, say storing value, you mean... What do you mean by that again? Like, uh, like Well, if... Um, if... I do something valuable for you and you pay me. I want to be able to keep that value in something that will not go down in value simply by the fact, because of the fact the government exists. Mm. Okay. Right. So Bitcoin, and if you store your value in Bitcoin, and what I usually say is it's not a good place to store value for money that you need soon. But if you have time to wait, it's always been a better place to store value than the dollar. There's never been a time when you couldn't, put money into Bitcoin, wait five years and be massively up. Mm-hmm. But if you had like, if you were like, Hey, I'm going to do a renovation on this place. and I got a hundred grand saved up and I'm doing this renovation in four months. Like you don't want to put that in Bitcoin because it might be way up or way down four months from now. So right. for things that are, are, are tied to shorter timelines, it's, it's a bit more of a gamble, mm. but for the long term, it is the safest place that you can put your value. And, What's happened to a lot of the world is that because the dollar is such a bad place to store value, like it's it's ridiculous to put your money in a savings account, right? Like you're going to be losing money after inflation, having your money in a savings account. And so everyone has kind of come up now with this idea that they feel like they need to become investors, right? And in reality, most people are not investors, they're gamblers, right? They're reading headlines, they're following hype, and they're, yeah. they're buying Netflix and Amazon, whatever they're 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 swing trading and trying to time the markets and the need to do all of this stuff, which is stuff that normally you wouldn't have average people doing in an economy. This would be like financial professionals taking these kind of risks. Mm-hmm. 
has just been priced into everything because you there there isn't really a way to 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 save now to save money for your retirement unless you're playing these games mm -hmm. right unless you got your money entrusted to someone else to grow it at a hopefully higher rate than inflation then you're you're out of luck do you think um we're just on a fast track to insane amounts of poverty for old people um in the next like even 10 20 years because most people aren't i mean i think a lot of people who are going to listen to this podcast this sounds like spanish to them like they don't, yeah. they're not even going to get the first sentence of what was said like like you know but these same people have different i'm not saying they're dumb i'm just saying like because they have different skills but they just maybe they don't have the attention span for it, the interest like their literal their reality is not think like that at all yeah. it's, you know the brain's too wrapped up in responsibilities and oh my god what am i gonna how am i gonna get little, my kid well, to a dance lesson and and it's like and it just seems like um well i think they i think it's already common knowledge that like the baby boomers the last generation that could probably properly retire like and be like when i say retires and they have enough money to live out. They retire at 65, they die at 85 for the last 20 years. They have enough money where they can eat, have food, shelter, clothing, and still afford one year vacation. They might not be fancy, but it's 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 like they can just chill. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, I think everyone else now is like, you're going to be constantly having to figure shit out or a lot of people are just going to end up being destitute because they can't figure yeah. it out. Well, one thing that I can tell you when, so when I got into Bitcoin um, and even, even like 10 years ago, it was like, it was all like, like, guys around our age, nerdy, like no women, no older mm. people. It was, it was like a daunting topic. Yeah. And it, uh, that's changed a fair bit. And I think COVID has helped change that a lot in the sense that like the world was very comfortable and a lot of people were happy to sit in their, in their lane and the, the 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 well, most people the just moochers, want to chill, right? That's yeah. Problem, and, yeah. and, and the moochers and the leechers, the, the, the um the people who steal from us the aristocrats of the world these days um have misjudged how far they can push and what that caused is that a lot more people started to wake up to the unfairness of the world in the way that there are lots of things about the world that are really just not right and i did That's a little same majority of things aren't right yeah i did a little <laughs> speaking tour um around alberta recently and i was really like encouraged to see the demographics um, we're seeing a lot more like, you know, you know, not, not, not the boomer aged people, but the, like the, the 50, 60 year old people that are, and a lot more rural people, people that are starting to see that the problem that's actually going on is that the government is stealing a huge percentage of our value from us. And that value was created with our time. And so essentially they're stealing our time. Yeah. They're stealing well, a chunk of our lives. They're stealing a chunk of your. Well, I think the primary thing they're stealing is energy. Like, yeah, you're just tired after working all day. Yeah, it's, like, it's, you it's, don't it's, have anything left in the tank to learn again. And um, yeah, but hey, but what do you think? You know, like based on your research, and you know, like I, I've done a lot of freedom movement research too. You know, I've seen the movies The Geist and everything like that. And you know, like uh, um, you know, like I, like I, like I love James Bond movies, not because of just awesome how as how how awesome 007 is, but like. You know the idea of specter right like the you know like that secret organization i'm like something like that's got to exist man like how whacked out everything is like something like that's got to exist like an evil group at the top that's super smart that wants to hog all the resources so that they can manipulate everyone just just for that raw feeling of power like darth sidious from star wars you know um but right now i guess what i'm trying to ask though it's like in a direct real time like the the government as they say like it's like because the government's not it's not like literally justin trudeau thinking about all this you know, like, um, it's, 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 it's whatever, it's that government, like the entire body of it, the people who are in that smaller group, you know, calling the shots, if you will, like, like, where is majority of this wealth going? Because it's certainly not being reflected on infrastructure, because otherwise, there'd be no crappy buildings, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, it's like, there'd be, there, there'd be no, like, I'm not talking about socialism, but the wealth would be spread in a way where there is no, like, there should not be homes. Yeah, like but because we reinvent our resource now. So, you know, so it's like I get it when there's homeless back in the day when it's literally like, OK, uh, you know, like Dave, you and I gotta go hunting for an elk and all we have is the, this this weight here. And somehow we got to make that just weapon. It's like, OK, that's fine. So someone might be homeless because he's sick, he's tired, he's unable to, to, to do it, you know. But right now it's like it's just like, where's all this money going? Like, like yeah, where, what's the corruption? Like, where like, what are they doing? with all this? So um, there's a story. Um, this pot's totally gonna get pulled for me too. <laughs> describes this uh, this phenomenon called the cobra effect. Yeah, and the cobra effect was um, the story originating in the 1700s in India, 
when the British were ruling India, and they had a problem with too many cobras in Delhi. And so they took the seemingly rational step of putting a bounty on the cobras, but they didn't really understand the local economy. And so the bounty ended up being like three times the average salary, like average monthly salary for one cobra. And obviously that was way too high. And so they killed all the cobras really fast. But now you had this class of newly rich cobra hunters who didn't want their, their meal ticket to run out. And so the cobra hunters became cobra farmers started just farming cobras <laughs> and handing them in. And they did that for years until the British finally caught on and decided to cancel the cobra bounty. They're like, this is bullshit. You can't scam our cobra bounty. And so when they canceled the cobra bounty, the cobra farmers released all of the cobras because there was no reason for them to have cobras anymore. Mm -hmm. And now there were way more cobras than when they first started. <laughs> and so it's a government policy that took a seemingly simple step yeah. to solve a problem that seemingly needed to be solved. And they missed one little detail and also one like pretty simple second order effect. And the result was that all that money was spent on Cobras and nothing was accomplished. Yeah. Is it, isn't it, uh, is, isn't it fascinating? Like human nature essentially is just us scamming each other in some, some degree. You know what I mean? Like everything's ultimately like that word scam. Like, well, we are like sales is ultimately a form of scamming, like in all ways, shape and form. Because if you really just need something, you wouldn't, you don't have to think or listen to someone talk or see a TikTok. Like you'd be like thinking, I need this. You go get it. You know what yeah. I mean? But almost everything else is a form of like, us manipulating each other well you know like that, that is true but that's exacerbated by the problem that i'm describing because mm -hmm. like when you run a business mm -hmm. you have to pay for all of the cobras yeah yeah right like all of the cobras that some government bureaucrat decided that you need to operate this premises you have to jump through those hoops mm -hmm. and when we buy a drink here we have to pay for the fact that you have to jump through those hoops yeah <clears throat> and that twists the incentives to everything and yeah. we're seeing that everywhere in the world. You look out the window, like any window, anywhere downtown Calgary, how many pylons do you see? Mm. How many people are working next to those pylons? Mm. How much do those pylons cost? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is like there are cobras everywhere when you start to look. And really, it's it's just a giant machine driven by the bureaucracy wherein they create jobs for themselves and they maintain their own jobs. Mm. And they're, they're, they're essentially solving problems that don't need to be solved. Right, we've got water veins breaking that mm -hmm. should have been replaced years ago, yeah. and meanwhile, we've got rainbow painted sidewalks solving problems that we didn't actually have. Right, and so it's this twisting of incentives, wherein the best way to get paid is not to provide, it's not to make the best pylons. Right, it's not to be the best sidewalk print painter. It's to get into a position where the person who decides how the stolen money gets spent decides I will give you the money for the sidewalk and I will give you the money for the pylons. And it's that kind of incentive twisting that leads to this idea that everything's a scam because at the core of it, like half of our economy is a scam because it's being, it's, it's our value being spent in ways that we didn't decide. It's mm. being spent by people who did not have the right to spend that value and well, that even, twists everything into a scam. Well, even even um, we're just just even our even our education system is a scam. It's like uh, like you know when you finally finish university, you're kind of like you're like man, my whole life I was taught you're supposed to get here high school to their university to get into a job. None of this is actually related. Mm -hmm. Like nothing actually did like for the day to day to you know is related. All it did was distract me from learning about money. And then I'm so tired all the time and stressed out. And yeah, there's the, the plus sides of you know, making friends and hanging out and partying and whatever, uh, yeah. meeting girls and stuff like that back in the day. But it was like, uh, but overall, you're just like, something was never right about this whole thing, you know? And, and then, and then, um, and now it's getting even more crazy where I don't know, man, like what, like what's your solution? Like, I mean, I know it's a grandiose question, but like, what's your, what's your, what's a broad approach solution to, getting this thing on track yeah. and how do we stop the human nature well, that, that is like, but, that causes all these problems to begin with. Yeah. There's two things. And one, like I was saying with COVID is a lot more people are waking up. Like even yesterday with this like Olympic boxing fiasco where. Yeah. I saw that. I, like, I don't think, was that a current, that wasn't a current match. That was that, that wasn't, wasn't that a match in the twenties? No, it happened yesterday. So, it okay. Was, I know there was the, I, there was the transgender, um, uh, uh, male to female, Boxer who boxes a female, uh, cis female, 
using those terms like um like i don't know i, I, yeah, I, don't, it was, know it was, I don't even know if i'm using it right it was but, a man that boxed a, boxed a woman oh, yeah so like but i thought wasn't that match in 2020 and then like now they're saying like coming up there like like the highlights i saw wasn't that an old match no or, the, was so, that a recent match? so there are old ones from the same dude fighting in the women's side but the one that really like struck a chord was yesterday and it was like the the one where he he basically punched her once. Oh, it and knocked her out with the, the was no, it, no, he didn't. He didn't knock her out, but he kind of twisted her her headgear, and then she quit. And then right? she went back to the corner, and she was like, "I'm not doing this." And the point where she broke down on her knees, in in tears in the ring, is one of those moments that kind of resonates. I think that struck a lot of people. Wherein, you know, we we know this is not right. We know it's not right for a man and a woman to fight each other in the boxing ring. That's absurd. Yeah, yeah. Right for a high majority of the matches anyway. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I'm sure there's that one outlier. Well, check, no, like it, it's know. it's there, there like there are there are there are some women in the world who can beat some men in the world in boxing. Yeah, yeah. But the the fact is that men have a drastic physical advantage over <laughs> women in strength based sports, <laughs> oh, and and just, something that's violent like that yeah. is like so far against oh. what like what yeah. we we're supposed to believe as men that we're supposed to protect women, not punch them in the face with a boxing glove right and yeah. that um that disgusting moment of the woman on the ground on her knees the silver lining to that is that that will affect people and that will wake more people up to this perversion of everything that is going on in the world and i i've seen it a whole bunch of times wherein the people that enter the freedom community so to speak usually come in with a certain a certain um issue that has rubbed them the wrong way in their lives yeah, the solution to this Sorry, I'm yeah, sort of the, like, yeah. the solution to this whole thing is that more and more people are waking up to the perversion that's happening in the world and when i say the perversion i mean the perversion of our money because virtually everything is downstream from money and when you twist the incentives you start to twist every other element of society and so what i'm seeing is that more and more people who've gotten into the freedom side of of the this this world and are starting to prioritize freedom inevitably start to see bitcoin as part of the solution to, as how to achieve freedom and so yes. as i mentioned the, all of those quotes you know we've been heading for this this solution to a problem that's been around for over a hundred years mm -hmm. this problem of fiat currency this problem of money printing and we have the solution now and we have a meme in the bitcoin community that's bitcoin fixes this mm -hmm. because bitcoin fixes in the long run a lot of the problems that are, are wrong with society just yeah. by realigning incentives yeah. and so if Bitcoin didn't exist, I'd feel really upset, really unhopeful about the world. But in a very real way, Bitcoin is our hope for the future. Bitcoin is the hope mm. that we can get back to a society where we deal value for value among among people in a way that's fair. So you um do you you full time uh, um um are a Bitcoin like a, a um miner a trader a collector like, like like bitcoin is you like that's what you do yeah i've like. been i um since i opened that store in uh 2013 i've been uh is it still there no it's not we we moved it on to 17th ave and then we eventually sold it in 2015. Okay. um ultimately we took the business which was the brokerage buying and selling bitcoin and merged it into another business to form a, uh, a new company called bull bitcoin in 2018. Okay. um so bull that's your company I, well, I'm not with Bull Bitcoin anymore. I still own part of the company, but Bull Bitcoin is, without a doubt, the biggest, best, most advanced Bitcoin platform in the world, and the most hardcore Bitcoin focused, Bitcoin values aligned platform in the world. Okay. Um, since then, I've done a bunch of other stuff. I helped take another company called Bitcoin Well Public, which was at the time primarily a Bitcoin ATM company, and I'm still on the board and uh, working there, advising there part time. Um, and then I recently started a new company uh, around the conference that we put on, the Bitcoin Rodeo. Yeah. And we acquired a website and YouTube channel called CoinBeast. Yeah. Um, Heather that you mentioned. Um, yeah. She's going to be on podcast next week. Yeah. She's, she's doing a show on uh, on our YouTube channel now called Unhypnotized that she'll hopefully be talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I'm, that's getting a lot of my time now. And then very importantly, I'm widely known as the strongest and best looking Bitcoin entrepreneur in Canada. So uh, strongest and and best looking and best looking, yeah. Okay, it's sweet. official. Nice. So. Well, what do you squat, deadlift, and bench? I haven't done that in a while. I just oh. assume. Oh, yeah. just just from just from the way you look, you're the, you're the strongest <laughs> well, one. Well, you yeah. know what? No, no, you're 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 thick. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I can tell you're strong. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't, I haven't lifted seriously in a while, but 
Um, but I, I can tell you the way that we've established the criteria. So it's, uh, if anyone wants to challenge me, they first have to be a Bitcoin entrepreneur in Canada. Uh -huh. And then they're going to need to establish that they're better looking. Okay. And so... I didn't argue about the better yeah, looking. And, I already know that's... In order to do that, we're going to need... <laughs> the, the, this is a criteria. We, and, and Ben, um, you've met uh, my, my good friend mm -hmm. with the YouTube channel, BTC Sessions. Yeah. Shout out Ben Perrin. He's, uh, he's going to be the judge if this ever comes to pass. Um, so we need 21 letters of recommendation from hot babes in the Bitcoin industry. Mm -hmm. And then the feat of strength is going to be who can throw the other person further. Okay. In what may, what way? We're talking about like, like, uh, however, style, however, however you can do style. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like John Cena's finishing move style. Anyway. Yeah. Any way that you can do it. So, hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, like the Bitcoin, a lot of Bitcoin people, I mean, like, I'm sure there's some who are fitness guys and whatever, but for the most part, I, yeah, just through observation, like, yeah, like there is a <laughs> lot of, um, well, nerds, if you will. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, no, you're, uh, but there, yeah. There's there's a whole backstory to how I got this title, yeah. um, and you can find that on my website, which is bitcoinbrains.com. I would tell the whole story, but we're okay. We just, long and we're <laughs> oh no, yeah, check, check, check it out. I, I'll I'll check it out. Yeah, um, yeah. The uh, yeah, I'm gonna wind this down here, Dave. Thank, thanks for swinging down. By the way, um, I hope this is one of many. You yeah, know, this um, is cool. You're extremely smart. Um, I, like I learned so much, you know, today. And I learned a lot that night as well. Um, and I plan to keep learning and, and, you know, like, and to be honest, like, yeah, well, like I'm, I'm going to, I'm getting into Bitcoin for sure. I mean, I do have a, I have a wall. I mean, you and I, I sold my sats to you the, the other day cause I had to, but, uh, you know, but, uh, yeah, we'll see. Cause I want, I, I, you know, I, I, deep down, I am for freedom at the end of the day. I, I don't want, like, I want everyone to be able to pursue what they love to do and, do, like I don't, I don't want to see everyone working hard. I want to see everyone like playing hard at their passions. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because that that's that's the way to live, man. You know, and it's just just blows my mind the, the overwhelming amount of uh, um, uh, just misery in this world. It, it, it's it's uh, it's 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 crippling sometimes, dude. Crippling. Okay. Uh, well, let's. I'll have you on again in the future if you're down, man. Because I still have so many yeah. questions. You know, like I feel like sure. I feel like we could have went for three hours. When you guys did your podcast here that one day. You guys film for five hours, yeah. <laughs> five hours, man. I was yeah. like, holy, you know, like, uh, we, we showed up kind of late and I don't, I've, I haven't well, watched back the part hours. that I was on there for. Yeah. I don't think it was that good. <laughs> uh, I tuned in a little bit. Yeah. You guys were definitely like just growing out at that point and, and just telling hilarious stories. Like walked in on, I think it was you talking about Justin Trudeau being a bouncer at some point being a crappy one or yeah, yeah. I don't know. And then, um, yeah, no, but yeah, but I, I like, yeah, this is a, uh, yeah, we definitely could keep talking, talking, talking. So I don't know. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'm probably I'll have more questions as I dive more into this this realm too because uh, like you, you you basically have to now everything's just so so fucked <laughs> so fucked. It's a good thing to learn about because it gives you some hope. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I'll be on the lookout to see if anyone's better looking than you in the Bitcoin world. You know, <laughs> um, you know. But right now, from what I've seen, like you got that thing locked locked I down. So yeah. Yeah, and strength wise, yeah, yeah, yeah you, you look strong, anyways. <laughs> pretty sure, pretty sure, uh, pretty sure you don't have this world title for a while. Do you have? Do you have a belt, like WWE style? I don't, but yeah, maybe I probably, should. Yeah, because yeah. like you need a way to formally transfer the title if if one day that does happen. If it doesn't happen, then you just wear it all the time, right? That's a good so, point. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, get get a belt. Yeah, uh, have it, have it. You know, I, I prefer a classic NWO look. You know, the gold, the gold around it. You know, not not like silver or whatever. You know, black leather, big a big uh, plate. And then, like, yeah, it's just so when you wear it on the shoulder, it, it sits better. <laughs> anyway, that's just that's just the way I see it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, Dave's uh, Instagram will be in the show notes there, and I'll, I'll put his website up there too. And uh, yeah. All right, okay. Thanks for coming on, Dave. Thanks. Bye.